Good morning. He is risen. This morning, I would like to share with you, I'd like to start off by sharing a song, but in the form of a prayer. And the song is out of our hymnal, number 64, To God Be the Glory. So let us pray. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his Son, who yielded his life an atonement of sin, and opened the life gate so that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. O oh, come to the Father through Jesus his Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. O oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood, to every believer, the promise of God, the vilest offender who truly believes, that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Praise the Lord, Praise the Lord. Let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. O oh, come to the Father through Jesus' his Son and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Father God, we just come today to worship you, to honor you, to praise you, to thank you for the tremendous sacrifice that you made for each and every one of us. Holy Spirit, I ask you to move within the homes of everyone who's watching today. I ask you to touch hearts. I ask you to convict hearts. I ask you to just lift them up, Father, so that they could see you and so that they could glorify you. It is in the wonderful, saving name of Jesus we pray. Amen. This morning, in my prayers, um, I thought about announcements, and, and, and announcements aren't where we're going to be at, at first. I want to share with you another song that uh, I've been singing all morning, and uh, it's He Lives. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that He is living, whatever men may say. I see His hand of mercy. I hear the voice of cheer. And just the, the time I need Him, He's always near. He lives. He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me and walks life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to us, or to him in part. You ask me how I know he lives? He lives within my heart. In all the world around me, I see his loving care. And though my heart grows weary, I never will despair. I know that he is leading through all the stormy blast. The day of his appearing will come at last. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to him in part. You ask me how I know he lives? He lives within my heart. Rejoice, rejoice, O Christians, voice and sing. Eternal hallelujahs to Jesus Christ the King. The hope of all who seek him, the help of all who find. None other is so loving, so good and kind. He lives, he lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives. Salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives? He lives within my heart. My God, he is arisen and he is alive today. And Amen. I am so, so grateful for that. This morning, I want it to be a time of celebration. I want it to be a time of just thanksgiving and celebration. So we are going to share communion together. Now, it's not something I don't think any of us have ever done, is share communion uh, virtually. But uh, it's something that I really want to do today. And I really look forward to everyone participating in their own homes, uh, with their families. If you're, if you're by yourself, know that you're with the family of God. You're, you're, you're one of his children. So I want to just share that with us today. And for those of you who don't come to Chapel Hill or have never been here, when we take communion, it's, it's called uh, communion, uh, Lord's Supper, it's called the Last Supper, but it's also called Eucharist. Eucharist comes from the Greek word that means Thanksgiving. So I do want today to be a time of Thanksgiving, and I want today to be a time of celebration. So why in the world are we celebrating? Well, a couple things. First one is our Lord has risen. Uh, the tomb is empty, he's defeated death, and Jesus holds the keys to death and to hell. We celebrate the tremendous sacrifice that God made for us. He sent his perfect son to earth 
to walk, to experience the, the heartache, the despair, the loneliness that we experience so that we would know that he understands the paths that we walk in life. We celebrate the fact that he has asked us to take our despair, our loneliness, and, and, and these things and just to put them on his shoulders. All we have to do is give it to him. So we celebrate that he's willing to take our daily trials and tribulations and carry them for us. Uh, we celebrate the fact that Jesus was willing to be punished for us. We, we celebrate that he gave up his body for us. We celebrate the fact that Jesus was willing to die for each and every one of us. We pray, or we praise God, and we celebrate the fact that he defeated death. We praise and celebrate the fact that the tomb is empty. We praise that we have a risen Savior. Amen. So that's why we're celebrating with communion together. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. It is just so magnificent to me in my heart to see what he has done for us. So when we take communion together, that's not, uh, communion is not a ritual that we do in church. Communion is something that we, we take seriously. I would like to read for you, for you from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 29. It says, The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, in the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This is the cup. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often you, as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of our Lord. Let each person examine himself then. And so eat the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment upon himself. What Paul is trying to do here is he's trying to tell us that communion is not something that we take lightly. And, and as we go enter into communion, we're supposed to take a time to look internally, look at ourselves. What are the, some of the sins that we knowingly do some of the things that we knowingly do to hurt our God. And, and Paul's telling us we need to repent from those, we need to turn away from those, and we need to go look at our Jesus in his wonderful face. Look at him straight in the face. I think the song goes, uh, what is it? Uh, look into his wonderful things. The things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of his glorious grace. I'm praying that each and every one of us would stop reflect, repent, and look at Jesus right into his glorious face, and that we would all surrender to him. And remember, the prayer that Joshua had for the Israelites, or the, the warning that he had, he told them he wanted them to have a renewed love for God. He wanted them to encourage them to love the Lord their God with all their heart, and with all their soul, and with all their mind. Now, he didn't say that, but he wanted them to love God the Lord with everything they had. And the last thing he warned them and encouraged them to do is just to cling unto Jesus for all that it's worth. And it's worth everything. Cling to Jesus. So we're gonna take communion today and it's to remember the great sacrifice that Jesus had made for us. And so as you go ahead and prepare your, your bread or juice or whatever you may have, I'd like to pray over that first before we move forward. Now let's pray with me. Lord God, you are holy and you are merciful and you are a loving God. We praise you this morning. And Father, as we take communion here in the next few minutes, I ask you to accept this bread and this juice or whatever anyone is bringing forward. And I ask you to take that and I ask you to bless them. I ask you to accept these things as an offering to you as we partake together to honor and remember you and who you are. It's in the loving name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. So go ahead and grab your bread. And I would like you to go ahead and get that. And forgive me if I go off camera real quick. Just... 
As we take this bread together, after we take it, I would like you to say out loud to somebody around you, if you're by yourself, say it to God. Just give him a praise for what he did with his body for us. Let's pray. Father God, as we sit here and getting ready to partake in, in, in the body of Christ in remembrance of what he did for us, it makes me think that we as, as his children struggle in the flesh in the world. We struggle in the flesh that, that Satan is able to lure us away from you. But Father, we know that your flesh was traumatized for us. We know that your flesh was torn asunder for us. Yes, Lord God, we just thank you and we praise you for that mighty sacrifice that you have made for us. Thank you. And we love you. Amen. Amen. So let's take this bread together and say out loud a praise to him. Thank you, Lord. God, you are awesome. And I lift you up and I thank you because it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be here today. Now we're getting ready to take the cup. And as you drink of the cup, I would like to um, remind you that what Jesus did for us. I would like to remind you that uh, he shed his blood so that you, his, essentially his blood just drained from his body and poured, shrouded over us and washed us as white as the purest of snow. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you. We thank you for your shed blood. We thank you that your love just overwhelmed us with your love and your grace and your purification. We thank you for that, Father God. We just lift you up right now. We honor you and we thank you. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. So I would like you to take your cup. And he said, as you take this cup, do it in remembrance of me. I would love to hear some of your praises. I forgot to tell Dina that that wasn't grape juice, it was cranberry juice. Oh my goodness. You should see her face right now. Um, <laughs> hello, that's what I had. But uh, God will bless it anyway, and uh, Dina will forgive me later. Maybe. You know, as I was struggling, uh, actually all week, I've been struggling with this message. I mean, how do you share a message about He is risen and just let it, people hear it, feel it, and be felt loved by it? I, I weighed so many things. I prayed so many things over my head. I thought about maybe we could talk about Mary as she came to the tomb and she just wept as she saw that her Jesus was gone in the despair that the disciples had as they discovered the same thing. And just all of that entailed. And I thought about you know, talking about death as a whole. I mean, some versions of the Bible say that death was abolished. And what that means is, you know, we look and we know that death is real. We, 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 we see death. We know that we're all going to die physically. But what that, that death was, was, was abolished, what it really meant is the sting of death has been taken away. It no longer hangs over us. Well, we, 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 uh, we may die physically, but we will not die spiritually. I thought about talking about a tale of two men. I mean, we had two men who died. One man stayed dead, one man arose. We had one man who, who uh, prophesied about it. We had another man who fulfilled it. The first man was David. The second man was Jesus. And as I weighed these things, I was just, nothing was really hitting home. Truth be told, it wasn't really till yesterday that things really started hitting home. Because uh, I, I was thinking all through my adulthood, basically my whole adult life, Every Easter message that I ever heard was a feel-good message. It was something that just kind of lifted you up. And I would often ask, well, why do we always have these kind of messages on Easter morning? And some fallacies in the answer, I was told, well, we often have people come to church on Easter. They only come a few times a year. And Easter they come, we want to give them a message that they can hang on to that's not going to scare them away. Okay, I mean, even now as we're going live, we're having a bunch of people participating in service that uh, have never even heard of Christ before, who uh, don't go very often. And so it would be even time, we don't want to scare people away. It's from what an earthly perspective is. But what God has been weighing on my heart and pushing on me is the fact that we need to speak truth. 
Now that's not to say that there's uh, not truth or there's not a feel good in, in, in truth because we know that our Jesus is truth. And we know there's a lot of good things about Jesus. So we could spend a long time talking about that. But something that was really weighing on my mind yesterday and that I would like to share with you is first out of Romans chapter three, verse 23. It says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every single one of us have sinned. Every single one of us struck, continue to struggle with sin. No, none of us are perfect. And that led me to, to Romans chapter 5, verse 12, where it says, Just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all have sinned. And as I think about that, every single one of us deserves death. I mean, but it wasn't originally supposed to be like that. Originally, God created Adam and Eve to be in the garden, to be in relationship with Him. It was perfect harmony. They walked with God. They talked with God. Uh, it was just bliss. But then Satan entered the picture and, and sin came into the world. And because of sin, there was a veil or a barrier thrown between us and God. Uh, and, and, and I've even had people say, well, that was Adam's fault. It wasn't my fault. Well, you know, we could discuss the, the merits of that statement for a long time. But it made me think yesterday of a song I heard once by Ray Bolts. It's called The Hammer. See, Ray Bolts was talking about this man who, who saw Jesus hanging on the cross. And he was just looking at, not understanding, why is this man of righteousness standing or hanging on this cross? He, he talked about, why is it the strong always victimize the weak? And he's just getting so angry at the fact that somebody nailed Jesus to the cross. Then he looked down at his hands and he saw that he had the hammer in his hands. Every single one of us have the hammer in our hands because Jesus died for each and every one of us for our sin. He, our sin from our past, our sin from our present, our sin that's even in the future, Jesus had put on top of him so that we wouldn't have to. We all have that hammer in our hand. But here's some good news. John three sixteen, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that all who shall perish, uh, excuse me, he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but he have eternal life. Amen. God, in the very beginning, recognized our sin. He saw that we were wretched. He saw that we were wicked. And he saw that we were going to, that we were going to die. We deserve death because of the sin in our life. And he did the only thing that could be done is to offer a sacrifice, a scapegoat for us. He sent his perfect son, Jesus, a spotless, sinless Jesus to die on that cross for us. Jesus became sin, a man who knew no sin. He became sin so that our sin could be lifted from us, that the that, that, that blood of Jesus just purified us and wash us clean. Jesus was willing to take that punishment of the flesh. He was able to, he was willing, God sent him, he was willing to take that punishment for us. God sent him and he was willing to take that death for us. So you and I, with the hammer in our hands, nailed Jesus to that cross. But you know what? That's why he came. In verse 17 of John chapter three, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn it but in order that the world may be saved through him. Jesus did all of that so that we could be saved, so that you and I, wretched people, could live with him eternally. The really, 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 really sweet part is, is that Jesus opened it up, he says here, all of the world. Every single person is invited. Now we talked last week that the road is narrow, the gate is narrow, because there's only one way, and that's through Jesus. But he opened it up for everyone. All who have sinned can have that saving grace of Jesus. All they have to do is accept it. So here we are today, Resurrection Sunday. Today is Easter. And a couple thousand years ago, Jesus was buried, but it was discovered that the tomb was empty. Amen. Jesus wasn't there. He is risen. Amen. And I started thinking, why do I believe that? 
Why do I believe that Jesus is risen? I could tell you because the Bible tells me so. It's even a great song because the Bible tells me so. But why would I believe that the Bible is true? We may explore this later about why the Bible is true or why we believe what the Bible says. But uh, I want to share with you just one right now why I think I should believe this. And it comes out of 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 21. I'm not going to read it, but I want to summarize it for you. Really what it means at this right here is a collection of historical documents written by people who witnessed the actual events. Or it was written by people who were witnesses to the eyewitnesses. And the really neat part is, every one of the people who wrote it, there were 40 of them, 40, uh, <laughs> there were 40 people who wrote this, and they were all inspired by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit inspired them to write this. And some of the really neat things about this, this Bible is a collection of documents that was written over a 1,500 year period. 1,500 years, 40 authors, 66 books that they all mesh together perfectly. And we could read some of the histories and, and some of the different things. I've read 6,000, I've read 24,000. But there's at least 6,000 original documents that support the Bible. I was reading even this morning about the Iliad, which has like 10 or 12 original documents, or, or even if I think Socrates, and when we all listen to what Socrates had to say, but there are zero original documents from Socrates. So I have this right here. It's a collection of, from people who witnessed it, or witnesses of the eyewitnesses, who wrote it and were inspired by the Holy Spirit over a 1,500 year to make 66 books intermingle perfectly. So when I read in here that... Uh, my Jesus died for me, I believe it. When I read in here that the tomb is empty, I believe it. When I believe, when I read in here that Jesus died and he defeated death and he rose again, I believe it. When he says he did it for me and he did it for you, I believe it because this is credible. That's just one of the many reasons why I believe this. So that is feel good to me. That is awesome. But now the thing that's been bugging me the most about today is I hate to burst your bubble. Because we all know that God sent his son for each and every one of us. We know that Jesus died for you and I. We know, or I know, that many of you have accepted Christ as your Savior, but yet you don't live like it. Mm. We don't live the way God has called us to live. We walk uh, on the wide road. If you were with us last week, I talked about the shimmering road. We walk on the shimmering road where we proclaim Christ up in the, in, in, in the shining of the light, but down in the deep, we still partake and we knowingly partake in sin. We have one foot firmly plant, planted in Christ and we have one foot firmly planted in the world. And it doesn't work that way, people. It does not work that way. You're either for God or if you're, you're against God. Amen. And there's plenty of examples in scriptures about that. I could read about how just a little bit of yeast, yeast will ruin the entire batch or, or how the, the old wineskin will ruin the wine. There's several examples of that you can't play both ways. It's either one way or the other. If you have your foot in the shimmering waters and you have your foot, in, 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 or if you have one foot in Christ and you have one foot in the world, people, it doesn't work out that well for you. You know, it made me, was even thinking even more something I read earlier in the week. We have a tendency as people to worship idols. We worship our, our, our jobs. We worship uh, musicians. We worship actors. We at, worship sports figures. We worship friends. But you know what? All that has been taken away from us and we're all in our homes. The world that we knew before is gone. It came to a screeching halt and now we're here. But the horrible part is that many of us have taken these idols we had and just replaced them with something else. We've taken them and replaced them with uh, online gaming. We've replaced them with books. We've replaced them with puzzles. Uh, just these things that we know. We've, or maybe we're binge watching TV shows now. Maybe we've even, uh, 
<laughs> Maybe we even got attached to Bob Ross and we're picking happy trees all day. <laughs> uh, people, none of these things are bad. And none of the things that we were worshiping as idols before were bad. But when they're, they're bad is when we take all this stuff and we just idolize it. We, we, we worship it. We, we spend more time in it than we do it in God. We've just taken old patterns and we've adopted them to a new world. Amen. I'm telling you people, we have to surrender. We have to fall on our faces before our Lord and Savior and just give it up. God, so what are we doing different, people? What are we doing different now that we're home? Maybe God is trying to get our attention. I don't know. But maybe he's trying to get our attention that we need to go to him. He's got us in our homes. He's saying, folks, worship me. Honor me. Spend time with me. Know that I am God. People, I encourage you, fall before him and surrender to him. Yes, day before yesterday was Good Friday. And we had a, a time of fasting and prayer with a missionary church. And I just noticed uh, uh, yesterday that it was a lot of different places. But in the missionary church, we specifically prayed for three things. We prayed first for God to have mercy on us. Uh, we have this coronavirus going around. People are dying. People are getting sick. And just praying to God for a vaccine. Pray to God for healing. Pray to God for protection. Pray, pray God and lift up all those people who are doing these service from hospitals to stores to stockers to, to warehouse people. All these people are doing things so that we could so that we could try to continue life as best we can. So, so we pray for mercy from God. The second thing we pray for is a deepening relationship with Jesus. Specifically, we prayed for our pastor. We prayed for our church, which is us, and we prayed for our families. And the last thing we prayed for is an awakening and a renewal within the church and within the nation Amen. and within our communities. People, that's what God is calling us to do. Come to Him. Worship Him. That's what He wants. Yes, you can still do all these other things. He's not taking them away. But He wants you to put Him first. You can't have feet planted in both places. So come to Him. Know that our God is holy. Know that our God lives and that He is our Savior. Jesus defeated death. Amen. Okay? <laughs> he defeated death. He rose again. He holds the keys to death. Nothing comes as a surprise to him. He holds the key to hell. Anybody who comes to him, pleads to him, falls before him is welcome, and he will not let hell take them over because he holds the key. One day we will die physically, but we will not die spiritually because we have eternal life through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The tomb is empty, and he is risen. We have a living Savior. This tells me that, and I believe it because it's credible. That's just from a worldly perspective, not taking into consideration the Holy Spirit and these things. People, we have a living Savior. I was listening to a song, well, actually, Luke 24, verse 34. You know, when you always hear, uh, He is risen, and people say, He is risen indeed. Well, Luke 24, 34, it says, The Lord is risen indeed. And I am so grateful for that. I was listening to a song yesterday by... Uh, a singer called William, by the name of William McDowell. It's called, I Give Myself Away. I did attach it as one of the links uh, yesterday, but here's some key lyrics. My life is not my own. To you, I belong. I give myself, I give myself to you. When we give ourselves, when we surrender ourselves to him, I want you to listen to those other songs. He lives, he lives, uh, uh, I want you to listen to my Dean where we lives. Up from the grave he arose. Okay, <laughs> Dean, give me a look. I shouldn't be singing. <laughs> but the point is, celebrate. You've surrendered to him, so celebrate. I want to end in a prayer. And I'm going to start off, the prayer is a prayer that Paul did out of first, out of first, out of Ephesians chapter one, verses 17 through 23. Let us pray. The Lord of our, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope in which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance 
in the saints. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his great might? That he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and he gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all, Lord God. We come to you. We surrender our lives to you. We recognize the sin in our lives, Father. We repent of those sins in our lives and we turn to you, Jesus. We turn to you as the Lord of our lives. Lord God, save us. We recognize we're sinners. We want to turn from the world. We want to get our foot out of the world and we want to place both of our feet firmly established in you. You've, that's what you've called us to do, Father. So we surrender that to you right now. Father God, I just ask you to take every person who watches, who listens, who hears about you, and I ask you to turn their hearts to you. I ask you to bless them. I ask you to love on them. And Lord God, we just praise you and we worship you because you are worthy. It's in the loving, holy, saving, risen name of Jesus we pray. Mm. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. May God be with you this week, and I look forward to seeing you next week. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Have a beautiful day.